We're shining on around the world. I want you to help me wait, make welcome everybody all over the United States and in 63 different countries now that will be listening to our broadcast today. We welcome you to our service. Thank you for tuning in. I'll begin reading in Mark chapter number 5 and verse number 1. And they came over into the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadareans. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he had been, uh, the Bible said, often bound, often bound with fetters and chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. And even worse than that, neither could any man tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones but when he saw Jesus afar off the Bible says he ran and he worshiped him please keep your Bible open as I preach through these verses in Mark chapter number five our story today is one of the most detailed revelations of a person that is possessed with demons. This account that you read in Mark chapter number 5 is also listed in Luke chapter number 8. But in the scriptures when the Holy Spirit is revealing to us the desperate need of this man, it's a strange thing that in verse number 4 he emphasizes that as part of this story, this man had supernatural strength in his body. He was able to break chains. He was able to break fetters. And the Bible said, neither could any man tame him. He was beyond hope and no doubt beyond help. But little did he know, though he had the physical strength to break chains and to break fetters, he did not have the strength to break chains that he could not see, much less be free from. I want to preach this morning on invisible chains I want to talk to you about the things that have you bound that others cannot see in your life I'm talking about the things that are only known between you and God that robs you of your liberty your freedom your joy and your peace you see not all chains not all bondage can be seen by the human eye some are what we call naked to the human eye. Others are covered by our personality, our smiles, our handshakes, and even our friendliness. But deep down inside the hearts of many people today, beyond the smile, the friendly handshake, and the welcome, lies invisible chains that has bound them up for untold amount of years. If God were to open our spiritual eyes this morning and show you in this packed auditorium the amount of invisible chains that are bogging down different people from different areas of life, we would probably all be shocked to death. So I pray that something I say today will relieve you from not only bondage that may be visible, but things that's got you tied down that nobody knows about. I would venture to say that most of the things that we're facing that ties us up and brings us into spiritual bondage are probably all found within the life of this one man. Because you see, he was bound with invisible chains. Uh, the Bible talks about his emotions. You know, people have emotional problems. In verse number 5, the Bible said he was always night and day, is what your Bible said. It was a never-ending process and a demonstration. There were several things that this man did continually from sunup to sundown. Number one, the Bible said he cried. When it talks about him crying, it's not talking about a tear running down his face or a quivering lip. It's referring to wailing out loud with an uncontrollable level of inner pain. This man would scream at the top of his lungs because he was so emotionally bound with invisible chains. He was not only crying at the top of his lungs and screaming and wailing, but the Bible declares that he was 
cutting himself. You gotta remember it's a continuation. He didn't just cut himself, he was always cutting himself. We call it body mutilation in our day. It would probably astound you to know that one out of five people sitting in this building today in one fashion or another has practiced body mutilation. Hoping that the emotional pain from inside would drain itself from their body by a gaping, open, bloody, fleshly incision. People are so emotionally distraught, they not only scream out in the night, but they cut themselves hoping that the outer pain will give them inner relief only to wake up the next day to find that the invisible chain is still there. The Bible also declares in his emotions that he dwelt among the tombs. He wanted to be accounted with the dead. So low was his emotional condition that he thought death, death itself was his only means of escaping the bondage of these invisible chains. No wonder suicide is at an all-time high in America. People are bound by things they can't identify. They're bound by things they cannot break. They're bound by things they cannot see. And so far are they gone emotionally that the devil has tricked them into thinking that death itself would be a relief from their invisible chains. The Bible declares he was in the mountains night and day. When they laid down at night, those that lived in the village below could hear his unending screams as they echoed off the sides of the darkened mountains and traveled down to the valleys below. No other invisible bondage is so real and so strong as to be in bondage emotionally. Locked up deep within the mind and souls of many people lies a thick change of emotional instability robbing them of their opportunity to enjoy life, happiness, love, forgiveness, and peace itself. Oh, the untold millions that were wet their pillows with tears every night, longing for freedom and sweet relief from this emotional torment and captivity that they face on a daily basis. Here is a man that's so emotionally gone that they've drove him out of the town and out of the village and out of the city, and they sent him up in the mountain to live among the tombs. If you study the land of the Gadareans, you would find that the floodwaters of the Sea of Galilee would sometimes come through the land. And because of that, they put their cemeteries on top of the hill so that the sainted dead would not be affected by the waters that would roll in. Here's a man that was so emotionally distraught, he was so emotionally gone that the town and the village he was bound with feathers and chains, so no doubt he was in trouble with the law. No man could tame him. He was in trouble with a psychiatrist. And they drove him up into the tombs and said, the only place we could leave a man that's so emotionally gone is to let him dwell among the dead. Are you sitting here today with an invisible chain of emotions that you can't seem to climb out of? Has something so drastic happened in your life that every day you wake up in a dark valley below? This man could equate with you, for he too was emotionally bound by invisible chains. It not only affected him emotionally, but it affected him morally. The Bible declares in Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 27, when you find the other account of this story, the, the Bible is very clear to tell us that that he dwelt in the tombs and wore no clothes. His mind was so twisted that the natural shame of being naked had fled from his very conscience. Can you imagine being morally so far gone that even in the presence of God himself, there seemed to be no attempt on his part to cover the nudity of his earthly frame? The Bible said when Jesus stepped out of the ship, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He was so far gone morally that he could stand in the presence of God naked and not even be ashamed and not even be embarrassed. When someone's moral compass becomes flawed and falls to the degree that there's no embarrassment and shame upon nudity and immorality, it's due to something more than just their personality and depravity possessing them. Yeah. 
The Bible is very clear that he contained an un unclean spirit, which means dirty, filthy, corrupt, through and through. Moral defiance is a pure sign that something other than that person himself is controlling the desires of their lives. Have you turned on the news lately? Every day of our life, it's new reports about child abuse, the elevation of rape cases, and the boldness of public perversion is evidence of these invisible chains wrapping around the hearts and lives and souls of unconverted men and women. Public perversion is one way of people reaching into the dark corners of evil, searching for the key that will give them rest and fulfillment in life. But I say to you, whether you're male, female, transgender, neutral gender, bi-gender, you will never find peace and satisfaction in life through your immorality. It's a demon out of hell. The lust problem that America is facing today is far beyond just the depravity of people that don't know God. Did you know rape has become so accustomed in America that for raping a woman now, a man only goes to jail for four years for raping a woman. Four years, and they'll be out of jail again. Now you say, well, that's not all that bad. What if it was your wife? What if it was your daughter? What if it was your granddaughter? Bless God, if he fooled with one of my family, one of these perverts, he better pray for more than four years because when I get my hands on him, he'd with the God, he's back in jail again. But maybe you fight lust within yourself. Maybe this depraved demon of an invisible chain is wrapped around you with lustful desires. 65% of men that go to church are hooked on pornography nationwide. One out of every two marriages will end up in divorce in the United States of America. 70% of this generation will cheat on their mate within the first 10 years of their marriage. We've got 70% we've got of the children in America that are either being raised by one parent, step parent, adopted parent, or grandparent. The family unit has been blown all to hell. This demon of lust has been promoted in our kids through the school system, through television, through internet, through the neighborhood, through their friends. Amen. You know I'm telling it right. And now preachers don't want to preach on it anymore because most of them screwing around with their secretary or somebody else on the side themselves. So they don't want to preach against this anymore. And the next thing you know, the church house isn't much more than a whorehouse and everybody's swapping around and fooling around and nobody wants to live clean and holy and dedicated unto God. Say amen right there! Maybe you fight this thing of immorality. Maybe you don't have an emotional problem. But maybe you have a lust problem from your past life. Before you converted, you fed your flesh in areas and ways that was displeasing to God. Maybe as a lady, you got wrapped up in lesbianism. Maybe as a man, you practiced sodomy, only to find out that it left you empty and void. They're now finding out that people that are having these transgender operations are seven more times to commit suicide than normal people that leave their gender alone. Seven more times have to commit suicide. Because after they go through all the money, all the pain, all the rejection, and all the embarrassment, they're just as empty when they're done as they were when they started. That's why they commit suicide. Maybe you have a battle in this thing with your morals. For you that have a battle with your, with your emotions and you look at people that fight morals, you may say, well, I don't understand why they don't get over that. Well, they may look at you and say, I don't understand why you can't get over your depression. Because if you've never been addicted and you never had to fight that battle, maybe sometimes you don't understand what people are going through. And here's a man that's not only got an emotional problem, he's got a moral problem. But it doesn't end there. He's got other chains dangling from him that he cannot see. He has a philosophical problem. The Bible said in verse number 3 that I told you the tombs were located in the top of the mountains. It was a hiding place for him to get away after they tried to bind him and tame him. 
He ran from him. I looked that word up. Neither could any man tame him. And that gives the implication of trying to train an animal to obey you. This man was so far gone morally, he was so far gone emotionally, he was so far gone philosophically that they said he acts like an animal. We need to treat him like an animal. His mental disarray allowed him to have such supernatural strength that once they would bind him with all the chains and the feathers and they would strap him around his wrist, his waist, and his feet, in just a matter of seconds, when they wrapped his naked, bloody body, he would stretch his earthly frame and break them all to pieces. Many attempts had been made to reform him, release him, and remold him, only to fail at each of their honest efforts. His chances of ever having a mental revival had long been accepted as impossible, many years ago by those that worked with him on a daily basis. If you were to ask about this man, they would say, he's a lunatic, he's crazy, he's demented, insane, nuts, mad, deranged, mentally off, disturbed, sick, ill, and he's a, he's a psychotic maniac. Have you got a philosophical problem going on in your mind and your body today? Did you know as I'm preaching this morning, 43.6 million Americas suffer from mental sickness. 14.4% of Americans have one mental illness. 5.8% of Americans have two mental illnesses. And a staggering 6% of Americans have three or more mental illnesses going on. And even though it racks up to almost 45 million, less than half the cases in America will ever try to get treatment or help because of their mental disabilities. But when I read my text, I realize that sometimes people don't need just treatment. They need transformation. The Bible said in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2, being renewed in our minds, being transformed. Here's a man. Can you imagine having all of this in your body at one time? You're emotionally shot. You're morally gone. You're psychologically a lunatic and a nut. You're foaming at the mouth. You got a long, untrimmed beard. You got long, greasy hair. You're naked. You're living in a cemetery. You got fetters and chains hanging off your body. Your body's soaked in blood where you've cut yourself. And everybody that passed by that cemetery and saw him jumping from tombstone to tombstone said, There's somebody that's beyond help. But he had another problem. He also had a he had an invisible chain of spirituality. Now stay with me. The Bible said in verse 9, Jesus asked him a question. What's your name? You don't think Jesus didn't know his name? But when Jesus spoke to the man, the man did not answer him. The demon inside him answered him. He had a spiritual problem. And the demon said, my name is Legion. The word legion is a German name that comes from their army, which means 6,000. This demon speaking to Jesus said, I'm not only a demon, but there's 6,000 of us in his body. No wonder his emotions were shot. No wonder his morals were shot. No wonder psychologically he was shot. No wonder spiritually he's gone. Surely he's beyond help to have 6,000 demons in him. The demon spirits were communicating with Jesus Christ through the voice of this one man. I believe all the former issues that I listed to you in introduction were just a byproduct of his spiritual situation. His ability to break the feathers and chains was known throughout all the community. There's no chain big enough and there's no fetter strong enough. But this man was bound with chains that he could not see, much less break. So if you're here today and you've got an invisible chain, maybe it's one that I didn't even mention, but you know there's something inside of you that keeps you locked up from being real and having a deep, settled peace. What do you do if you're having emotional problems and you can't get stable? What do you do if you fight lust every day and sometimes the flesh overtakes you and disappoints you and God? What do you do when philosophically, even maybe your own family and friends look at you and say, there's something wrong with them, they're not right. 
What do you do when you realize that maybe you're not right with God, you're not ready to meet God, and there's something inside of you that's controlling you? Am I beyond hope? Preacher, I can't even see the chains. I can feel them, but I can't see them. They're invisible. How can I break something that I can't even see? I'm glad the story doesn't end in verse number 5. But verse number 6 makes all the difference in the world. In spite of the fact that I'm emotionally shot, in spite of the fact that I'm morally shot, in spite of the fact that I'm psychologically shot, in spite of the fact that I'm spiritually shot, here's what the Bible said. And when he saw Jesus... He ran. He ran. Y'all ain't getting this. I said when he saw Jesus, he ran. <laughs> you say, my God, preacher, how am I going to break this emotional trauma? Run to Jesus. What about my lust? Run to Jesus. What about psychologically? Run to Jesus. What about me spiritually? Run to Jesus! He's not a answer. He is the only answer. So, <clears throat> you mean to tell me just running to Jesus can solve my problems? Well, let's look at verse 15. After this man gets saved, the Bible records three things about him. Number one, he's seated. Now, wait a minute. Aren't you the one that jumped around up in the mountains? <laughs> Aren't you the one that was emotionally shot? Aren't you the one that couldn't find peace? Aren't you the one that couldn't find love and forgiveness? Aren't you that lunatic that lived in the cemetery? Yeah, I am. I don't run around like that anymore. I don't jump around like that anymore. I'm seated now. I ran to Jesus. He took care. Bless God Almighty. He took care of my emotional problem. But wait a minute. Aren't you the one that was immoral? Aren't you the one that ran around naked? Aren't you the one that didn't have any moral compass anymore? Yeah, that's me. Look at verse 15 again. He's not only seated, he's clothed. <laughs> By running to Jesus. By the way, I'll ask you something. I don't believe this man had a duffel bag. I don't believe he had a backpack. I don't believe there's a Walmart around the corner, thank God. Now, if he ran out of the tombs naked, and he was crazy, and he was in the presence of Jesus, and he gets saved and sat down, where did he get his clothes from? You see, the same God that can save you is the same God that can supply your needs. He didn't have any money. He didn't have a credit card. There wasn't a salvation army. But the same God that converted him is the same God that can clothe him. Just by running to Jesus? Oh, yeah. Look at verse 15 again. He's seated and clothed. Remember that psychological problem he had? And the Bible specifically said, and in his right mind. When I started going to church, my daddy set me down, Brother Leonard, and said, you know, some religion will drive you crazy. He said, my aunt read the Bible one time and went nuts. Spent the rest of her life in a mental ward. Well, Lord, I'd already been locked up three times. Spent one 30 days with a man that thought he was a rooster. And the last thing I wanted to do was go back to a mental ward. So I was afraid of that Bible. But you know, when you're lost, you can do crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. And people think nothing about it. I drug a cigarette machine out of a wall one night with a chain and a car that I stole out of a beer joint. Drug it down the road. That thing bouncing eight foot off the ground. Got 55 packs of cigarettes and $255 in quarters. And I drug that thing home. And my family found out I did it. And they all sat around the table and said, well, Phil, there's nothing wrong with you. Everybody drags cigarette machines down the road. 
in a stolen car. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just a kid. Went through three mental wards 30 days at a time. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just an average kid. Went through three dry out clinics. Put rubber blocks in my mouth to keep from gnawing my tongue and swallowing it. But you're just a kid. Everybody goes through these transitions. My daddy picked me up out of my own vomit. My sister that was here last week said our daddy wore a car out chasing you through the ghettos and getting you out of jails. And my family would sit down and say, that's... There's nothing, son. You're, nothing abnormal about you. You're just a kid. November 22nd, 1975, I got born again. And I came home with a big family altar Bible. And I came out home that night with 36-inch bell-bottom blue jeans, 4-inch white platform shoes, a dirty T-shirt, and the biggest family altar Bible you've ever seen in your life. My hair is in a ponytail. I walked in my house and said, I got an announcement. I got saved. You know what my family started saying? He's crazy! I'll tell you something, brother. Religion may drive you crazy, but when you run to Jesus, he will put you in your right mind. Bless God if I'm crazy, leave me alone. I'm having the time of my life. Now, but he needed to be saved. Where does that come in at? And this is where I want to get to, and i got to hurry and close. So when Jesus cast the demons out of this guy, they ran into a herd of swine, and these pigs ran violently down a steep place into the sea, is what the Bible said. And I've told you this before. I put this in the margin of my Bible. Any demon-possessed pig loves the beach. <laughs> I didn't say that now. I'm telling you what the Bible said. <laughs> Boy, was that clap vague. Was that vague. Oh, yeah. You Myrtle Beach people, look up here at me. Bless God, you ladies run around in bikinis, got enough cellulite to make somebody seasick. So they cast the demons out of him. He went into the pig. Well, the people that owned the pigs got mad. So they ran in the village and said, hey, man. This guy over here cast demons out of a fellow. They went in our pigs, and they went into the water and come out on the other side preaching, you got to be baptized to be saved. And so now, our hogs are gone. We've lost everything. We're going to go confront that fella. Now, here's how I know he got saved. Watch this, Brother Cliff. And the Bible said when they came to him that was possessed with the devil, they came to Jesus first. They couldn't get to him. They said, hey, we're going, we're going after that fellow. And they started toward him, and he was seated and clothed and in his right mind. They said, hey, we got something to say. Jesus stepped between them and said, he ain't saying anything, ain't saying anything to it. He's mine now. He's my child. I forgave him. It's all under the blood. He's been delivered. I got news as a child of God. Every demon of hell can come after me if they want. But between me and them stands my big brother that shed his blood on the cross. I don't care what kind of chain you have. You can be delivered if you run to Jesus. It's that simple, yes. I want to close with this. In 1874, a young man was born by the name of Eric Wise. He was one of seven children. His daddy was a Jewish rabbi. And he moved to, North Car to New York City as a Jewish rabbi with his wife and seven children when Eric was only 13 years old. In 1894, Eric went to his dad, a Jewish rabbi, and said, I've decided I want to be a professional magician. Of course, his family and the neighborhood laughed at him. So to keep from having his Jewish name and his Jewish heritage, Eric Wise changed his name to Houdini. It was then that in 1899, his career took off with his ability to escape from chains that were locked. Many times he was placed underwater after he was wrapped in chains and sealed with locks. And once he was secured, they would literally baptize him underwater and he would get free. In 1912, for the first time, he was not only wrapped in chains and they were not only locked by local police officers, but he was hoisted up by his feet and let down feet first into a glass tank 
and the world watched him fight for his freedom for the first time. A straitjacket wrapped in chains, sealed with locks. But the one thing Houdini could do that most people cannot do was he could hold his breath for three minutes. And in the three-minute period of time, he was such a great magician that every time he could work his way out of that straitjacket, pounds and pounds of solid steel chains and locks. On October 31st, 1926, at the age of 52, Harry Houdini died in Detroit, Michigan from a ruptured appendix. Many of the artifacts that Houdini used back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s were auctioned off years ago by his brother and his family. Most of them were, were bought and purchased by one of the most famous magicians alive today, David Copperfield, that lives in Las Vegas, Nevada. He bought all the artifacts of Houdini because he was a master of getting out of chains and locks. But there are some chains and locks that even Houdini can't get out of. There are some chains and locks that no magician can get out of. But there is not one that the Lord Jesus Christ cannot break in your life and set you free. Here's what the Bible said. And if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. From the inside out, we are free. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise in his house today. While we stand on our feet, I'd like to ask you a question. These are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses Righteousness being restored And though 